2013, folks. I'm Funky Monkey. Welcome to my house of love. Further to this, welcome to a very special episode in which we take a look at the works of one Theodore Geisel. Of course, you and I know this wizard of wit and wordplay by another name, Dr. Zeus. Yes, today we're taking a look at three of his books, or rather, the adaptations of those books. But we won't be looking at Hollywood's film adaptations, for my own reasons, yes. Instead, let us focus on the animated extravaganzas of the 1960s and 1970s. And unless anyone cares a whole awful lot, then the Lorax TV special is the first one we've got. Originally aired in 1973, the Lorax tells the tale of the titular character who speaks for the truffula trees, upon which the unseen onceler has devious designs. So grab your need and sing along with the truffula trees as we hear the word of the Lorax. A young boy goes to hear the tale of the onceler, and a sorry tale it is. Ask him. He knows. We then flash back to the day the Onceler discovered the truffula trees. Then I saw the trees, the truffula trees, the bright coloured tufts of the truffula trees. My! Immediately infatuated with their tufty foliage, he set to work making the Sneed. But here is where we meet our protagonist, the Lorax. Hollow, tufted trees. I want to live in Dr. Zeus's world. You're crazy with greed. Well, there's no one on earth who would buy that fool's need. But when the first need is sold, the Onceler is vindicated. In no time flat, an industry is started. Onceler alone, so promptly I built me a radio phone. I called my brother. Which is bad. Bad news for the truffula trees. The Wunsler family was working full tilt. Oh, so I promptly invented my super axe hacker, which whacked off four truffula trees in one smacker. Ladies and gentlemen, Fern Gully's leveler, as filtered through a veil of Doctor's use. I'm scared too. But with success comes the trappings of urbanity, which is bad news for the surrounding wildlife. <laughs> Oh, the ritzy, glitzy 1970s. They were fake and gaudy and absolutely vile. Glad I was born at the end of them. But the Lorax won't be denied. Yes. The Lorax continues, showing the Onesler the profits of industry. There's not enough truffula fruit to go around! I see. The Onesler reconciles his conscience, reasoning... But if I didn't do them, then someone else would! And that someone else would still have to face down the Lorax. But the Onesler is blinded by greed. The greatest stock is up. Up 27 and 5 eighths points. Wow. Wow! Rowdy doll! Now you listen to me, Pop. I'm figuring on biggering. <laughs> and biggering. From outside in the fields came the sickening smack of an axe on a tree. The very last truffula tree of them all. And so the Lorax leaves the Onceler to his fate. Don't forget the grim look on his face when he heisted himself and took leave of this place. As we flash again forward to the present date. Unless? Yes? And our special ends on a hopeful note, as the last truffula seed is given to our youthful audience surrogate. So that was the Lorax TV special. And you know something? I'm gonna put this into the House of Love. Sure, it's a heavy-handed ecological fable, but as TV tropes put it, some anvils need to be dropped. And you can dress them up pretty like Fern Gully or James Cameron's Avatar, but at the end of the day, the direct approach will always win through. So the message is clear. 
unless we put a bit of thought into resource management, we are going to run out. One down, two to go, sports fans. Join me after the break for more fun and frolics. Welcome to part two. Now, while I could spend hours agonising over the perfect way to introduce this next special, I believe it speaks for itself. Let's talk about Horton Hears a Who. Originally airing in 1970, Horton Hears a Who is the tale of Horton the Elephant's adventures with a tiny ball of dust, which is home to the Who's of Whoville. And of course, the despicable types that make fun of our pachyderm protagonist. But let's not focus on that. Instead, let us concern ourselves with the wonder and whimsy of... Horton Hears a Who. On a hot May day in the jungle, an elephant hears a small noise. This is Horton, our main protagonist. Also star of Horton Hatches the Egg, many years prior. Look it up. Oh, and no, he's not mad. But a disapproving kangaroo is not convinced. Jane kangaroo, and the small kangaroo in her pouch said, Hump too! But down on this seemingly insignificant speck of dust, there's a whole world. A speck no end. Your buildings to you might seem terribly small, but to persons of our size, they're really quite tall. And we introduce to our second protagonist, Dr. H. Hoovy. I live here in Hooville. Horton and Hoovy are both considered to be mad for their beliefs. That's perfectly right, Doc. We don't and we won't. <sighs> People are so stupid. Well, they'd have to be, or they'd be watching this show. <laughs> but then the plot kicks in when the know-it-all kangaroo declares Horton an outsider. Who? You have forced me to take drastic steps against you. Well now, ain't I just got an anti-authoritarian streak a mile wide? Her minions steal the clover. You're trying to shatter our morale. You're trying to stir up discontent. Why not? Hidey high, hidey ho, let us play hide and seek. And deposit it in a field of identical clovers. The place that he hid it. He let that small clover drop. Somewhere inside. But our pachyderm protagonist won't be denied, and his persistence is rewarded. Mr. Horton, for goodness sake, where have you been? And our protagonists are reunited. Are you whole? Are you well? Am I well? Such civic disaster has never been topped. And so the Who's of Whoville rally around Whovi. What to do? I wish I knew. I could make a Republican joke here, but... But in the macro world, that good-for-nothing kangaroo is having none of it. Wickersham cousins and Wickersham in-laws whose help I've engaged. You're going to be roped and you're going to be caged. And as for your dust speck, that we will boil in a hot steaming kettle of diesel nut oil. You know, for kids! And in the micro world, it's time to be heard. Sound off, sound off, it's time to be heard. But someone isn't making noise. Named Jojo, standing. Just standing. And bouncing a yo-yo. Make a yip. Make a yop. And that yop is all it takes. Yop! And so our special ends with the kangaroo relenting. Is a person after all. So that was Horton Hears a Who. And despite the genocidal kangaroo, I'm still going to put it into the House of Love. Yes, it's maddening, it's infuriating, this villainous kangaroo doesn't nearly get enough of a punishment for attempted genocide, but it's also a beautiful piece of Chuck Jones art. A testament to a timeless tale of not just respecting people, but of tolerating differences in neurotypicality. And now we come to the last of our three specials. Christmas may have come and gone this year, but we're in plenty of time for next year, 
as we take a look at the original How the Grinch Stole Christmas TV special. <laughs> Originally aired in 1966, this is Dr. Zeus's classic tale of a mean miser with a small heart who plans his revenge on Whoville for celebrating Christmas. So let's finish the Christmas season in style with the original How the Grinch Stole Christmas TV special. It's Christmas Eve, and the Grinch regards Whoville with jealous eyes. The Who's down from his cave with a sour... Now... The big question is, is this the same Whoville from Horton Hears a Who? Never addressed. Never alluded to. For all intents and purposes, it might as well be a different one. And so this greasy black banana peel of a Grinch conspires to dress up like Santa. With this coat and this hat, I look just like Saint Nick. <laughs> and ransack every last bauble of festivity in Whoville. And drums, checkerboards, bissel dinks, popcorn, and plums. And he stuffed them in bags. Then the crinch very nimbly stuffed all the bags one by one up the chimney. Of course, following this, security was tightened in Whoville when the next year they bought a burglar alarm, which they promptly placed in the town square. And even the sight of young Cindy Lou isn't enough to turn this Grinch's black heart. Who, who was no more than two. She says a light on this tree that, that won't light on one side. All of the myriad twisting fables one could tell a two-year-old, and the Grinch chooses a broken light on one side. And so this despicable despoiler takes the hall to Mount Crumpet, intending to dump the lot. Who's down in Whoville will all cry, boo-hoo. That's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. But even without the trappings of commercialism, the Who's of Whoville are still singing glad tidings. Welcome, welcome, Bob. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. And it certainly doesn't come from the Christmas episode of your favourite soap opera. This brings a change of heart in our now hero. And he brings back the festive. He rode into Whoville, he brought back their toys, he brought back their floof to the Whoville. And so our special ends with the Grinch as guest of honour at the Christmas feast. And he, he himself, the Grinch, Carved the roast beast. And that, my dear audience, is how the Grinch stole Christmas. And it's a clean sweep, as I'm going to put all three of these specials into my house of love. I know that this one is schmaltzy and sentimental, but whatever you call this great festival slap bang in the middle of winter, it's a great time to be together. And this special tells it straight. All three of these specials, they are legendary for a reason. Even though the Lorax was lacking in the touch of Chuck Jones, all of these specials were lovingly crafted, with the involvement of Seuss himself no less, by the same animators and visionaries that brought the beloved Looney Tunes to life. These specials represent animation history, and I can't think of anything more worthy of the House of Love. So thanks for watching, and join me next week for more fun and frolics. So long, folks.